So I want to um, begin by setting a context for uh, the discussion this afternoon. <clears throat> Starting with this slide, recently uh, Prime Minister Abbott said, man and the environment are meant for each other. And he went on and said, and Greg Hunt is an environment minister who appreciates that the environment is meant for man and not just the other way around. Now this is the view I reject. It supposes that the long winding process of evolution over more than four billion years was predestined to peak with the arrival of Homo sapiens, a species for which this lengthy period of evolution was a preparation. I find it astonishing that 155 years after the publication of On the Origin of Species, that this should be the predominant uh, paradigm. Most, uh, most of us, including, for instance, Tony Adler, are clearly living in a pre-Darwinian uh, world. But herein lies a paradox. <clears throat> Although in no sense was the arrival and dominance of Homo sapiens a predetermined evolutionary plan, humans nonetheless, by a combination of our numbers and our technological uh, facilities, have come to so dominate the planet that the further course of evolution uh, will be delimited by what we decide to do. And how are we discharging this awful responsibility? Not at all well is the answer. But before I delve into that, I want to mention a few other contextual matters. <clears throat> the most fundamental belief underpinning science is that nature is knowable, that nature is consistent, the progress of science buttresses and supports this belief. For me, the fact of this consistency provides an ethic to be consistent with our understanding of nature, uh, to work with that lumbering four billion uh, year evolutionary process and not against it. Many years ago, in a book called The Environment Game, Nigel, Nigel Calder one time editor of New Scientist, uh, wrote this, and I think it's one of the best non-anthropocentric definitions of conservation sustainability. Within the rules of the environment game, the primary aim is to sustain diverse and active living communities in which non-human life can resume in, compa in comparative tranquility the ponderous process of evolution which has been so disrupted and confused by the eruption, and I underline the word eruption, of man, that man can lend a helping hand. Nature knows nothing about ethics, <coughs> ethics or morality. An epidemic or an earthquake will strike the rich or the poor with equal ferocity, and similarly with any uh, infectious disease. Ethics is a human invention. But I believe nature, through science, provides us with an ethic and it is to accept that we are an integral part of nature, totally dependent on the biophysical world um, um, and we must assume this awful responsibility for the future of all life, including human life, on this tiny speck of cosmic rock, the only uh, place in the universe, as far as our present knowledge goes, that we will never know. Let me enunciate another principle that helps set context. Humans have evolved as a gregarious species, with strong links at least within the in-group. Much is said about equity and fairness between people, but this nearly always refers to equity and fairness between the existing generation, intra-generational equity. Much less attention is paid to equity between the generations, those generations yet to be born, intergenerational equity. I would suggest <clears throat> that intergenerational equity is more important than intragenerational equity for two principal reasons. Those yet to be born cannot participate in decisions now being made decisions which will heavily affect their lives. They have no uh, voice in present councils. Unlike those now living, 
we must make decisions on their behalf. Looking at the future development of our sun, it suggested that we might have another 500 million years of evolution on this planet, barring a catastrophe. So, meshing that with the earlier um, uh, statement about um, the, the responsibility to future generations, um, I see that um, we have, uh, as a species, uh, a responsibility also to allow our own evolution to continue. I'd like to quickly summarise a few indicators of how poorly we're discharging our responsibility as indicated by the definition provided by Nigel Calder. The limits to growth in 1972 indicated a collapse of our industrial civilization in the first half of the present century if we continued on a business as usual course. The work of Graham Turner researching the actual data from the last 30 and 40 years, he's done two, written two papers on this, looking at the actual data, the follow-up on the limits <coughs> indicates that we are indeed on the business as usual trajectory and collapse is imminent. Energy use which underpins every activity in a modern industrial society is becoming uh, rapidly constricted. Food production so heavily dependent on the use of oil um, has uh, led to a definition of industrial agriculture as being the process of using uh, soil to turn oil into food. Five years ago, Sir John Beddington, who was then UK Chief Scientist, said, our food reserves are at a 50 year low, but by 2030, 2030, not that long uh, in the future, we need to be producing 50% more food, we need 50% more energy and 30% more fresh water. There are dramatic problems, he said, and they're all intimately connected. You can't think about dealing with one without considering the others. We must deal with these all together. To which Jonathan Porritt, who chaired Tony Blair's <coughs> Sustainable Development Commission, replied, and I quote, but though I totally agree with John Bennington's analysis, I think he's got the timing wrong. This perfect storm will hit much closer to 2020 than 2030. <coughs> this timing is borne out by Graham Turner's analysis and by much other evidence. The rate of increase in uh, food production for major crops and, uh, and animals is in fact declining and has now fallen behind the rate of increase in population. The unravelling of our industrial society of over 7 billion is already underway. The revolutions in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia and before that Uganda and Rwanda have been dealt with by the media as having political and religious causes. But what has been glaringly absent is the resource population conflicts that have underpinned uh, these uh, conflicts. People who are denied the basic necessities of, of life, that is food, water, shelter and security, are ripe for revolution. Jared Diamond covered the situation extremely well in his book uh, Collapse in relation to Rwanda. In Egypt, the shift uh, from being a, um, a net oil exporter to being a net importer led to the abolition of uh, subsidies on food and fuel, setting the seed very much for the revolution which has occurred in, in uh, Egypt. And there are lessons here for Australia which is rapidly, rapidly consuming its natural capital in its exploitation of non-renewable resources. These are just some of the figures of Egypt. <clears throat> and similar shortages of water and food uh, against the rising population uh, have catalyzed the revolution in Syria which has driven 2.5 million people to become refugees. <clears throat> While China's demand for wheat is rising by 17 million tonnes per year, if we put this
this into context, Australia's um, wheat production, which shows uh, that in a drought year we produce less than China's present annual increase and only four times our own domestic consumption. We're often told that Australia is a big country and can support a lot of people. 6% of our land is arable. If we put the uh, Australia into context, we're really not much bigger than Borneo. If you look at the 2002 figure for Australian wheat production, you'll see we produced about 10 million tonnes, considerably less than the annual increase in China's um, uh, consumption. Discussion has often been centred on whether Australia should, should take refugees from the islands of the Pacific as they sink beneath uh, rising sea levels, but this ignores the likelihood that the same climate change will vastly reduce Australia's ability even to feed itself. We may well become the refugees seeking somewhere else to grow food. So within uh, this context, what might be the ethics of migration for Australia? There are between 10, uh, 20 and 40 uh, million displaced uh, people in the world, some 11 million being regarded as refugees. Approximately 1 billion people are malnourished and up to 3 billion suffer some dietary insufficiency. And world population is growing at between 70 and 80 million people per year, many in poor countries. There is no way that this human catastrophe can be solved by any form of migration, nor will populations keep growing at this rate. About 4,500 children die uh, of water-related diseases every day, the equivalent of 10 jumbo jets falling out of the sky with no survivors. Compare that with the efforts now being made in the Indian Ocean to find one jumbo jet. 15 million children die each year from starvation. Approximately 220 million women of fertile age who wish to control their fertility do not have access to family planning uh, or to reliable supplies of contraceptives. When one puts uh, together and this together with the fall in the availability of critical inputs of food production, water, oil, phosphorus, arable land, and takes into account a possible rise of temperature of four degrees by the end of the century, it's clear that this situation can only get worse. As a corollary, it must be remembered that Australia will not be immune uh, from the impact of any of these factors. I believe that within the context outlined above, there are two overriding conclusions. The world must move from a continuous growth paradigm to a steady state paradigm, a steady state within nature's limits, and in this task Australia could play a leading role. Australians are not living sustainably at present either with respect to the Australian or with respect to the global environment. Even at 23 million, too many of us are demanding too much from the Australian and the global environment. A key and critical role would be for Australia to set out to put its own house in order to try and find its own difficult path toward an environmentally sustainable Australia. Doing this not in an attitude of isolation, but in a spirit of cooperation with other nations, helping them find their own uh, difficult path to a sustainable future. And this would mean limiting our own population growth and also reducing our per capita environmental demand. This attitude of cooperation with other nations would contrast strongly with the prevailing attitude uh, of competition with other nations. Secondly, I believe we should greatly increase our foreign aid, redirecting this uh, reduction um, and redirecting this toward reducing as rapidly as possible the rate of population growth through providing every woman with the means to control her own reproductive activity, 
and encouraging those in the poor countries to recognise the benefits of smaller families. Programs similar to that run by the Population Media Centre come to mind. There is clear evidence that in poor countries per capita GDP is adversely impact impacted by population growth. The last budget, the Labor budget, set aside $1.1 billion for the asylum seeker program. The foreign aid program has never been as high as 0.7% as recommended by the, uh, the United Nations. It presently 0.39%, that's the Liberal estimate, and the expected actual spend in 2013-14 will be $3.6 billion. In uh, this last year, our population, Australia's population, grew, and Jenny mentioned this, by 405,000, 60% from net overseas migration. We brought into Australia 241,000 migrants. If we use the figure of infrastructure cost of $200,000 per person, the cost of this migration was $48 billion in either actual dollar costs or indirect costs through failure to provide the necessary infrastructure. Now, take that figure and compare that with the Good Marker Institute's figure which said that it would cost only $4.1 billion a year to provide birth control to all 222 million women in the world who want to limit their pregnancies but lack access to contraception. Ethiopia provides an example of the well-intentioned misdirected efforts uh, to aid. Those are the figures I've just given you. And the... Um, in 1984, at the time of the Live Aid Concerts, which raised approximately $100 million, Ethiopia's population had grown to 39 million and in 2014 it's 95 million with a median age of 17.6 years. Half the population is still to enter their reproductive years. 30% of those under the age of 5 are malnourished. There are now almost as many malnourished children as the total population at the time of the live aid concerts. Every species on Earth, including our own, will reap the devastation caused by our massive increase in numbers and our unsustainable exploitation of nature. <coughs> Bending all our efforts to develop an environmentally sustainable Australia, while massively assisting other nations to find their own path to a sustainable future, and especially helping to reduce population growth, is the very best and therefore the most ethical direction. Migration is no longer either a practical or an ethical option. It represents a waste of precious resources and time. Thank you.